So good evening, everybody from the IJOC Secretariat. We are here again together for being a part of the webinar Ophthalmological Resident Teaching Series 19. YTS will be giving us a platform for the young generation to come up with the academic activities and as, as a whole, with this type of programs, the bond between the different states of IJOC will be tightened. Through IJOC, Eastern India is gaining its position and repute in the National Ophthalmic Forum. Our Chairman Scientific Committee, Dr. Shabhashachi Patnaik, has framed the webinar in a meticulous way, supported by the Chief Coordinator, Dr. BNR Subuddhi Sir. The program is mentored by none other than past President AIOS, Dr. Ajit Babu Maji. The session will be moderated by Dr. Omega Priyodarshini. Speaker of the evening will be the past president of the AIOS, Padma Shri, Dr. A.K. Grover Sir, who will speak on evaluation and management of the entropian. Isaac feel extremely honored to have you in our webinar. We had also a galaxy of panelists, Dr. Sharmista and Dr. Chandana Chakravarti, who are masters in their field. Discussions are choose from the different academic institution across the country. Before continuing further, we'd like to, with this, I'd like to hand over the proceeding to Dr. Pranab Ranjan, the president of the IJOC, with the welcome address. Over mm -hmm. to President Sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swaraj, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of ISOC, I welcome you all to this uh, common clinical situation that we come across every day in our day-to-day -day practice. To take us through this topic, evolution and management of ectropion, we have none other than the international expert in this field, Dr. A.K. Grover, sir. Dr. Omega Priyadarshini will be moderating this webinar along with our panelists, Dr. Sramista Behra and Dr. Chandana Chakrabarti, along with a bunch of enthusiastic discussions. I express my gratitude to Dr. Ajit Babu Manji and Dr. BNR Subuddhi for their spirited support and effort to the cause of training and teaching. Dr. Jayanta Barwa, Dr. Swaraj Bhattacharya, Dr. Sabesachi Patnayak and Dr. Sunil Surana have always been helpful and always stood up for the benefit of ISOC. Once again, I welcome you all along with the audience for the night. Let's have a great golden scientific hour of learning. So over to you, Swaraj, Dr. Swaraj. Thank you, President, sir. Now I'd like to transfer the podium to the Chief Coordinator, Dr. BNR Subhuti, sir, to continue with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swaraj. Let me sir. Sorry, I'm not able to. Yeah. Is it okay? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. We can see. Give it a slideshow. Uh, just one minute. Yes. Respected President. My friend, Secretary Dr. Swaraj, and Office Bearer Sapu IJOC. Once again, I welcome you all to our program IJOC RTS 19. And today, as uh, Dr. Swaraj and uh, our President Pranab has already mentioned, none other than international fame, Dr. A.K. Grover, as the speaker and topic already told. So today's episode, we have the IJOC team of Dr. Pranam Ranjan, President of IJOC, Secretary Dr. Swaraj Bhattacharya, and Chairman Scientific Council Dr. Sabhishat Patnaik are there. And we will be shortly the, we'll be joined by our President Dr. Jain Porva and Dr. Sunil Surana. Mentor, yes, everybody has told about uh, our mentor and, uh, and I have nothing more to say about him. He is a constant inspiration for all of us for this program. I am the Chief Coordinator and today I have the honor to present before you Padma Sri Professor A.K. Grover. I am one of the learned speakers on this uh, oculoplasty. I am really fortunate to get him today. 
as you as i told you is the president of the octoplast society of south asia professor ega grober the recipient of padma shri everybody knows she is one of the highest civilian awards in india conferred by the president of india he chairs visions i centers and department of thermis at gangaram hospital new delhi both world class institutions with post gazette and post doctoral teaching programs Dr. Gower is currently the president of Ocular Plastic Society of South Asia, Ocular Trauma Society of India, and the College of All India Ocular Society, which oversees subspecialty education in the country. Professor Gower has been the president of All India Ocular Society, Asia Pacific Society of Ocular Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and Ocular Plastic Society of India. He has also been the chairman of the Academic and Research Committee and Education Committee of AIOS in the past. He has been awarded the prestigious Arthur Lim Oration Award and Distinguished Service Award by the APAO. I state chairman the leadership of the Asia Pacific Society for Ocular Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery and of the Trauma Society besides an honorary fellowship of the ICO and also FRCS got the Rangachari award for best paper in the IAS in several prestigious international and national name orations and awards he serves as the editorial board of numerous ophthalmic journals including the Asia Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology Dr Grover is credited with the development of sub specialty in India in the I mean Asia Pacific region He has conducted and chaired scores of courses and delivered over 1,000 invited lectures all over the globe, including World Congress, APO, AO, APA, SROCPS, British Ophthalmology Surgery Society, Latin America, Europe, so many, so many societies. He has authored and edited five books, contributed over 80 chapters in test books, and over 50 peer-reviewed publications. This is in short about him, and if I tell, I mean tell about him, I think uh, they know enough for listening to his uh, webinar. Lecture, I would say. So, with these few words, I welcome you, sir. And I have had a lot of times from you, and I also again I want to repeat to listen to you today. Uh, as so, uh, already my um, the um, uh, other part, other uh, discussions and panelists have described our pre president, and this uh, I don't want to waste much time. Now, I, I request our moderator Omega to take over the. podium and please invite the president once i mean the speaker once again to start the webinar thank you all hope you are there yes sir yes please am i audible sir yes yes please carry on okay okay good evening esteemed seniors dr grover and our post graduates thank you sir for sparing your valuable time for today's session surely all of us we'll have a great learning session from your clinical pulse on the topic over to you sir thank you dr omega thank you dr pranav ranjan dr ajit babu dr subuddhi dr swaraj it's a huge privilege to be a part of this east zone teaching program and uh, i'm really happy that east zone is carrying out such a wonderful activity giving us the opportunity to interact with the post graduates and there is no greater pleasure than being able to do that so i will share my screen i will hope that we can have a extremely interactive session and uh, just keep discussing things as they go so that there are no doubts left in the mind uh, of any post graduates so we have a panel i hope uh, that can keep asking questions i'll keep asking them so that we can all be quite active and discuss all the aspects understand all aspects as we go so i'll be speaking on assessment and management of entropion entropion as we know is in turning of the eyelid margin it is sometimes congenital but most times it is acquired and we need to deal with this because of the problems that it causes to the integrity of the globe by causing irritation and structural and functional issues congenital entropion is a rare entity and the lashes tend to turn in here in a child usually it is a self limiting condition which tends to die out by the age of 5 years but in case it is causing symptoms and it is causing stippling of the cornea which can be seen on fluorescent stain it's leading to exposure keratop leading to irritation keratopathy and 
is leading to photophobia and symptomatic child, it may need to be corrected. Now, the true entropion that occurs in some cases needs to be differentiated from the condition of epiblepharon, which is because the lashes have turned in because of a fold present, as you can see here, which is very often present medially in mangaloid races. It is often associated with an epicanthus. And this epicanthal fold or the skin fold in the lower lid tends to turn the lashes in. Now, this again can be a self-limiting condition and may not require a surgical intervention in most cases. In some cases, it may need to be tackled as an aesthetic procedure within uh, with a correction of epiblepharon as well as the epicanthus. So when congenital entropion is symptomatic, it may need to be tackled by surgery. The procedure that is carried out may include a bit of conservative skin muscle excision, which is called the PANAS procedure, but it may be combined with Hoth's type of sutures where we are taking a bite through the skin muscle, taking a bite through the tarsus, which is at a level further away from the margin so that this would lead to a further outturning of the margin. But it has to be done conservatively and it has to be done with great caution as in children, the laxity, the excess skin is not present and you could easily end up in overcorrection because the patient is in a supine position and you may underestimate the amount of outturning you have caused. So you need to be really cautious combining skin muscle excision with oats type of sutures, which implies that if the bite is about two to three millimeters away from the margin in the skin muscle, this bite may be further away, say four to five millimeters, which would cause the lashes to turn out further. So you have to combine these two at times, but done in a conservative manner. Now the most common entity we come across is the acquired entropion. Psychiatricial used to be the most common as uh, uh, Dr. Subuddhi and uh, Dr. Pranav Ranjan will testify. We used to see all trachomatous cases and this was probably 95% of all cases of entropion at one time. But now the most common entropion we see is involutional or age-related entropion. So this is an illustration of a cicatricial entropion which used to be due to the trachoma. And trachoma was one of the most important blinding diseases in our country, accounting for almost 20% of the cases when we started our oculoplastic career. So let's look at cicatricial entropion first. Um, Anybody in the audience will answer a question? Their names. <laughs> Jyoti, uh, can I... Dr. Pallavi or Jyoti? Dr. Pallavi? Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Have you seen entropion due to trachoma now? Any cases? No, sir. Not now. None of the older patients also? No, sir. Any of you has seen, any one of you has seen a Dr. Shredda or Sonali? Dr. Shredda? No, sir. We haven't seen any Sonali. In North, we still do see cases with old sequelae of trachoma. With, um, what, what happens? What are the other findings that you see in those cases? Can anybody tell us anything? Okay, let's go on to that later. So, cicatricial entropion would result when you have an imbalance between two lamini. So, we know the eyelid is divided into two lamini. First, we have the skin and the orbicularis oculi with lashes anteriorly. This is constituting the anterior lamina and the posterior lamina comprising of the, the firm tarsal plate and the conjunctiva with its associated Muller's muscle and the levator aponeurosis 
constituting the posterior lamina. Now, if there is an equal balance in the two, the lashes are pointing anteriorly like this, well away from globe. But when there is a relative disproportion between the two, if there is a shrinkage in the inner lamina, this margin would tend to get pulled through. I hope you all remember your physics experience, uh, physics teaching where you had a copper and an iron plate and when it was heated or cooled and there was a differential increase in the dimension of the two, it used to turn in one or the other direction depending on which one was contracting. So in a similar fashion, like if you have two structures here, I hope you can see my two hands. And if this inner structure tends to become shorter, you will tend to get a turning like this. So when we talk about secretarial ectropion, we'll talk about this lamina getting shortened, leading to turning out like this, turning out of the margin like this. So that way, if there is a shrinkage in the internal lamina due to some cause, disproportion, then it would least lead to turning in of the eyelashes or an entropion. Now, we know that trachoma was the predominant condition and what we used to see was a thickening of the tarsal plate or tylosis spelled as T-Y-L-O-S-I-S. -S. And we saw this is the subtarsal sulcus or ALS line which we used to have. We used to have these meibomian openings all turning back. Now, this is the sign of all secretarial entropians. The meibomian gland openings, instead of lying on the margin, the margin has become rounded and the meibomian gland openings have all shifted posteriorly. So, this is a characteristic sign. The normal pattern that you see on the tarsal plate of meibomian gland ducts are no longer seen because of the cicatrization. So the, this was what we saw and this is still we, that we see in many cases of uh, secretarial entropion that we get due to various other causes that we'll talk about. But tylosis used a classical feature, thickening of the tarsal plate was a classical feature of trachoma. And then we used to get such corneal opacities uh, resulting with vascularization with panis. And with repeated surgeries, the lid often lost tarsus with notches, with a hanging curtain appearance and damage to the vision. But other causes of mucosal shrinkage are the predominant ones now. We get uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, edema multiformi syndrome, uh, some most often as acute episodes. Ocular cicatricial pemphigoid as a chronic disease in the Middle Ages. Chemical burns is again a common problem. And diphtheria is not, not so common, but other infective conditions which lead to a persistent, which lead to a scarring on the inside, simplifron formation, entropy, and etc. can all occur. So now, what is important to assess is before we take a decision on management as to the severity and the sequelae that it is causing, whether it is bad enough to be leading to corneal changes, persistent irritation, persistent congestion uh, to the eye, and also state of tarsal plate is, is useful in making a decision on what procedure to carry out. So let's look at the principles of management. Now, if you just have trichiasis or turning in of cilia and there are isolated cilia, you can tackle them with either radio frequency as we are doing here, using a low current in the coag mode. You use only two or three settings, just enough to cause a little bit of frothiness here, a few bubbles and the lash becomes loose and you can take it out. So you have to have those special needles. I'll show that again. This is the trichiatic cilium. You're given a local anesthesia and then you pass this specially designed insulated probe along the direction of the follicle of the cilia. So it has to be perpendicular to the direction in which the cilium is coming out. 
and then a little reaction, a black blackening here that you can see, and the psyllium should become loose. You don't need to pull it out by force. So similar thing can be done with electrolysis. Sometimes if it is localized, you can just do a local excision of those cilia. And cryotherapy is another modality, but the shortcoming in Indian eyes is that if you do a cryotherapy, you can get a little depigmentation, which is not so apparent in uh, Caucasians, but for us, that can become a cosmetic concern. So that is not usually used alone, but only along with lid splitting, as we'll see later for dystichiasis. So these are the modalities. So many of you would be familiar with the electrolysis machine that we used to have with this fine tip, which was used very often with this kind of a probe for electrolysis of cilia. Good local anesthesia is essential as the current can be painful when you pass the electrolysis current or when you do a radio frequency in these cases. Now, dystichiasis is another condition. Important to note this spelling here. This is different from trichiasis and so on. This is a abnormal row of cilia corresponding to meibomian gland openings. Now, why does it happen? It can be either congenital or it can be acquired. Now, once this happens, you have cilia coming from meibomian gland openings by a dysplastic process in acquired but in congenital by an abnormality where you have this complete row of cilia from the posterior lamina. So, if again, it is if it is isolated, you can just do a localized uh, radio frequency or um, um, electrolysis. But if it is extensive, then you may need to split the lamina and do a cryopexy of the posterior margin. And in more severe cases, you may need to do a excision. Now, you can see these abnormal row of cilia arising from the posterior thing. This was a congenital one. So we are splitting the two lamina, and here we are excising this whole layer because a, a, a small strip of posterior lamina has been removed and we have that defect there which we are going to take care of by taking this mucosa from the lower lip. So this is the graft being harvested from the lower lip which we will divide into two so that we can use it for both the upper lids. And then we can put a little glue there. Fibrin glue is useful, which will reduce the need for sutures. But usually, we prefer to put in some sutures as well. So after the fibrin glue has been placed, we will put some supplementary sutures and then Sometimes the if the glue is good enough, we can leave it like this. And this takes care of the problem of dystichiasis rather well. But you need to do it with meticulousness to ensure that there are no cilia left and the direction of the remaining cilia does not get altered by this procedure. Is this much clear? Now the congenital entropian, trichiasis and dystichiasis. So, Pallavi, will you answer? Yes, sir. So how many, how often have you tackled trichiasis or dystichiasis? How often have you seen these cases? The trichiasis cases I've seen, sir, in the OPD outdoor basis, they come complaining about foreign body sensation in the eye due to the rubbing of the lashes with the cornea. What is the what has been the cause in those cases? Sir, the lashes rub on the corneal surface is causing irritation of the nerves. What is the cause? Why has it occurred in those cases that you have seen? Sir, maybe because of entropy or maybe most of the cases after injury, we, uh, traumatic entropy has occurred. Then uh, Anical trauma can also cause a misalignment and cause an Entropian or trichiasis, yes. yes sir. So, uh, we do appellation of the lashes. Okay, only appellation and then uh, 
how so soon will they come back? Sir, after. Oh. How long do they take to come back? Anybody else? Jyoti, Jyoti, Dr. Jyoti. Around, around three months, sir. They come back within a month. So that is the problem. So why not do something else? Electrolysis. Or radio frequency. Electrolysis is very cheap. It is available for, machine is available for two, three thousand rupees. Now more difficult to get. But even radio frequency is available quite cheap now from Indian sources. So we should try and do a radio frequency of the cilia in the coag mode so that we can get rid of them more permanently. Now, it's not that no none of those cilia come back because you can't be precise in the direction of your radio frequency always. But almost 70% to 80% may not come back. The rest that come back can have another round of radio frequency. And district cases, have you seen it? Any of you? Pallavi? Sonali. Dr. Sonali? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. I haven't seen district cases. Okay. Anybody else who has seen a patient with district cases? You can understand. Dr. Shraddha? Okay, Shraddha, can you tell us what is the difference between trichiasis and entropion? Dr. Shraddha. The entropion involves the whole uh, turning, in turning of the eyelid margin as well. Uh, whereas in trichiasis, you, we just have the inward turning of the eyelashes. Uh, it may so not... A more uh, precise word is misdirected. Misdirected, yes, sir. Because of localized scarring or whatever. Hmm? Uh, or distortion or whatever. But in entropion, there is a wholesale interning of the margin. It may be partial, it may be full uh, breadth of the lid, but it is an interning of the margin. Lashes are turning in only because margin has turned in. But on the other hand, trichiasis can, can be present without entropion. Of course, it may be present with entropion also, but it can be a distortion or misdirection even in the absence of entropion. Okay. And district cases, you understood, is a totally distinct thing where meibomian gland openings, which are in the posterior lamina, how do you differentiate between the position of the anterior lamina and posterior lamina at the margin? Yes, Shraddha? It's the gray line. Okay, so the gray line, as you can see, a distinct color change in that area or the gray line, which is the zone between anterior and posterior lamina. So the lashes which will be growing starting from behind the gray line will be from meibomian gland openings and they will constitute this tichiasis. Okay. So that is why the distinction in the management protocols. So just related to this, sir. Can somebody tell what is marginal entropion? Ask my name only. Can somebody tell me? You can ask my name. Jatir Mai? Kidan Mai? What is marginal entropion? Shashmita Panda is there. Shashmita Panda. Um, uh, yes, Jyoti. Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti. Okay. Ma uh, marginal entropion is that ma malposition of this. Uh... Actually, it is a very milder form of cicatricial entropion, which is diagnosed only by the position of the mucocutaneous junction, as sir uh, told in previous slide. There will be rounding of the posterior lid margin and the anterior migration of the mucocutaneous junction. So it is mostly missed in the OPD. Patient is symptomatic and we cannot diagnose in that 
we should look for the mucocutaneous junction in all symptomatic patients thank you sir you can continue any anybody who knows about lash ptosis can somebody tell us what is lash ptosis so lash ptosis is uh, there is a kind of um, dissociation in that only the anterior lamina only the lashes are tending to turn in the margin as such is not changed now this tends to happen in some cases uh, either congenitally or sometimes after some surgical procedure where only the lashes have become instead of slightly upward direction they have come inwards even though they may not be causing any irritation or rubbing but it can be an aesthetic problem after some surgery so after some surgeries you may tend to get lash ptosis so you should ensure that you try and avoid that in your surgical procedures so these are the different terms you need to be familiar with dr aman uh, is my fellow has he joined in because there are certain animations which don't work on mac so i have requested him to be present with us okay aman sir, i'll join sir so i'll tell you when um, we need those animations okay, okay sir okay sir. yes thank sir. you thank you that time i'll have to stop sharing and you'll have to show the animations yeah sure sir okay so let's go to the surgical procedures for correction of entropion now now there are three broad principles on which this is done so one is that you have uh, now again the example of two lamina here this is the margin let's say this is the margin and if you have uh, a procedure which creates a fulcrum somewhere in the middle and rotates the margin out so create a fulcrum somewhere here and rotate the margin out by using tarsal tarsal plate as a fulcrum we will see the example of this and we will see an animation on this to understand how this works so the distal part of tarsus is rotated outwards by creating a fulcrum in the tarsal plate now a second group of procedures is where you can split the lid at the gray line or the gray line may not be distinctly visible in these scarred corneas but at the margin posterior to the lash line and then rotate the anterior lamina away like in jesche arlt's procedure where you will remove a bit of skin so that the anterior lamina gets pushed away with all the cilia but if you also put a graft in the in the uh, in the intervening area which has been created now by rotating of the skin um, lamina skin muscle lamina anteriorly then it is called mucous membrane grafting or the von mellingen's procedure we'll look at that and a third principle is correct the cause itself strengthen the posterior lamina so you this is done with some a graft on the posterior lamina of some mucosal or more importantly mucosal with cartilaginous or some kind of a support as well tarso conjunctival muco cartilaginous or something so now let's look at the first principle that is the tarsal rotation procedures now there are several procedures you can do tarsal thinning by what is called pairing or you can create a wedge on the remove a wedge on the surface of tarsus to call to cause a create a fulcrum and cause a rotation you can do this also by the procedure called vice procedure or tarsal fracture procedure where you give a full thickness tarsal cut so these are the two procedures broadly more commonly used which will explain the principle of tarsal rotation i think it's time to have the uh, uh animation to understand the principle aman i'm stopping sharing can you please share and uh... just to say so essentially the distal part of eyelid margin is turning in in secretorial entropion which is the source of our problems because it is rubbing against the cornea 
So if you rotate that distal part away from the globe, this is the commonest principle that is used. And you often have thick tarsus in these cases. So that helps by um, allowing the cilia to turn away and no longer cause a rubbing. Aman, possible to share your screen? Just a second, sir. I'm sharing my screen. I'm sharing my screen. Go ahead. Okay. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So show the wedge resection first. Wedge resection, yeah. It doesn't work on Mac. Not opening? Uh, it's playing. No, it's not seen with us. Yeah. I'll replay it, sir. Is it visible, sir? No. No, no, no. Only we can see the file. Getting open. It's opening for you, but not for us. So maybe you need to have it open and then is have it open, then share your screen and click on that area which is showing the animation. Go back and unshare unshare. Okay, sir. Let's try it this way. Open the open uh, on your laptop, open the uh, one of the animations. Yes, sir. Have it open uh, and shortened on one side. Then start. Then share. Start your sh screen share. Is it visible, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Now let's see if it plays. So this is what we've done: a skin muscle spindle, and then a wedge of tarsus has been excised here. And then when this defect in the tarsus is present. If there is a suture that is put now, it causes the lash to turn it. Does this explain the principle? Can you repeat it once? So skin muscle spindle excision, given a, an incision given at the lid crease, then a tarsal wedge removed, wedge-shaped piece of tarsus, which creates the fulcrum around which the suture causes the rotation. So does that explain the principle? Yes. Okay, can you go on to tarsal fracture now? Yes, sir. So I think after this, when we see the video, the principle will become very clear. That's so now you, we can play it again. So, so this here, you can see that we made a full thickness cut in the tarsal plate. You can see that cut? Yes. Now, this is the bolster red one that is seen. Suture is passed such that you start with the distal fragment, come to the proximal fragment. Distal one, you are in the posterior lamina. When you are coming out, you are coming out through between the two lamina, skin muscle and, and emerging close to lash line anteriorly. So starting with the part which is further away in the upper lid, higher, higher tarsus, then between the two lamina and emerging close to skin on the anterior lamina. So it is deeper close to the fornix inside and superficial closer to the uh, lash line in the skin. Here, I don't think you can see my pointer because his screen is... Can you, Aman, show yeah, it yeah. with your pointer? Yes, sir. So the suture is passed such. This is a principle of a outturning suture or a suture which is causing an ectropian outturning by anchoring deeper in the fornix on the inside and coming out closer to the margin on the surface by passing between the two lamina. Is it clear now? 
Yes. Any of the postgraduates, have you understood how this fulcrum is being used to rotate the margin in a tarsal fracture? Anybody? So this is, the red one is shown is the bolster through which we pass the suture. Usually it is done as a double arm suture. So those cause the rotation. By, so the principle is essentially the same. Okay. Can you have the other tarsal fracture one also? I think it's similar. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just a second. Any postgraduate? Is the principle clear or is it not clear? So it's the same same thing shown here, where you are causing this fulc this to turn out. So I think you can unshare now. No okay. question. Is it okay now? Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. So now, wedge resection is suitable for some cases, not for all cases. So as you saw, we need to remove a wedge of tarsus. So this is therefore applicable only in mild to moderate entropian, secretarial entropian with thickened tarsus. So if tarsus is not thickened, it's not easy to create a fulcrum with a wedge resection. Now, what do we mean by a wedge resection? Let's see on the video. The wedge resection involves... Can you hear the audio? The marking of yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. the lid crease line. So this is the lid crease line. The auricularis to expose the tarsal plate, which is then exposed by a thorough dissection up to the roots of cilia. A wedge throughout the width of the tarsus is then marked out and incision is given at the upper and the lower end of the wedge so marked. The incisions are bevelled on either side so as to meet near the conjunctiva, thus creating an incision which is like a wedge. The triangular piece is being cut, which is what is this a wedge. piece is removed throughout the pit. Got stuck at that point. So um, that is the way the incision is made along the entire length of the tarsus. So if you have a thickened tarsus, you remove that wedge along that entire length of eyelid. It is important, therefore, to work not with the entropian clamp. You've seen the entropian clamps, which you are often given in the exam to identify the right upper lid one is, the, is for left lower lid and the left upper lid one is for the right lower lid. That's called the entropian clamp. But the, risk, the problem with that is that it doesn't allow you to do the edges. And it doesn't allow you to check the rotation on the table. So that is why it is important to work with uh, a lid spatula. If you've done a good hemostasis, when you give your injection, give it with some adrenaline. If you've done that, then it will work. Uh, you, you will not get much bleeding as you see in this surgery. It is being done with a lid spatula in position that you see here got stuck so i think we now it's moving but it's not showing up as movement so then you pass oh, oh, very slowly grover yeah maybe heavy file so once you have this gap here and you pass your sutures you pass your sutures in such a way that you take a bite from the tarsus above the uh, point this is surgeon's view so this is close to the eyelashes and this is the part, superior part of the tarsus. And then you pass your sutures, three double arm sutures, through the upper part of the tarsus and come out very close to the lashes here on this part of the tarsus. When you tie it, you can actually physically see the rotation. 
is getting stuck. So you're not able to see the, you can distinctly see the rotation. When you pass this suture around this fulcrum, you can see the margin turn out. So that is the procedure. So all that is left to do now after the wedge is removed is pass three double arm sutures like this, evenly spaced so that both the ends are everted out well. And when you tie this, it rotates around that fulcrum and causes the turning out. Refusing to go to the next slide, let's see. Stuck. It's probably opening. Yes. Okay, okay, so let's go on to the next surgery, the tarsal fracture. So again, you need to give a block and then you need to give your tarsal incision, which is four millimeters from the ma margin. Why do we need to be at least four millimeters away? Because we are giving a full thickness cut and we would like the marginal plexus to be on this side so that the vascular supply of this area is not curtailed. So this that is why most incisions for cutler beard, everything else is at least three to four millimeters away from the margin. So that marginal plexus remains here. Now we've gone through the full thickness of the tarsus and we have dissected on either side to create a gap. And then we are passing the suture. Now this is against the upper part. And this is the part close to the lashes. So we are starting our bite with three double arm sutures from the upper part of the tarsus coming between the two lamina. Now this is the skin muscle lamina. This is the tarsal lamina coming out between the two and emerging close to the lash line on the anterior lamina. So three double arm sutures like these are passed and then passed through a bolster. This bolster is nothing but a polythene tube. So now a uh, part of a polythene tube which we use for intravenous, the usual butterfly. So evenly spaced, three such sutures are passed. We are starting from inside only to make sure that we are not causing less material to be outside on the tarsal surface to cause irritation. But the principle is the same. You are passing it from the upper part of the tarsus, coming close to the margin and passing three double arm sutures, which are passed through the bolster. Now these sutures are kept for two weeks. You can use an absorbable suture like white krill or you can use a suture like silk which will be which are more reactive you don't want a, a suture like nylon which causes very little reaction because you would cause some cicatrization to take place to turn the margin out so you could see how the lash has turned out now the only problem with this procedure can be that you can cause an overcorrection at that fulcrum so you have to titrate your tightness well now let's have some postgraduates tell us whether they've understood how the margin is getting rotated. Who will answer? Lakshmi is there. Dr. Lakshmi. Good evening, sir. Yes, Dr. Lakshmi. So is it clear how the rotation has taken place? Yes, sir. So, which cases sir. would you do a uh, um, wedge resection? Wedge resection means in case of thickened tarsus. Thickened tarsus and it is not such a severe, mild, moderate. Mild, They're moderate. Easy to rotate. Yes. And in severe cases with not so thick tarsus, you'll have to do a full thickness tarsal cut in order to cause a rotation. Okay. Yes. So, you understood how it is rotating around that fulcrum. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any doubts to anybody? So let's go on to the next group of procedures, which is marginal plasties. Here, as I said early, you are rotating the line anterior lamina forwards by creating a gap between anterior and posterior lamina. As you can see here, we put a graft here and the lash line is here and the posterior lamina is here. So you split the gray line and you put, you remove a spindle of skin muscle here so that the lash line moves away. So when you put a graft, it becomes von Willingen's procedure. So let's look at the video. 
So when do you need this kind of a procedure? Now, this is indicated where earlier surgical surgeries have been done. And we often used to get cases where tarsus had almost been lost. And you had no tarsus to do a tarsal rotation procedure. And the whole lid was turned in like a window curtain. And then you need to do a rotation of the cilia away by putting in a graft there. So let's see the video. Getting stuck again. It'll start playing, I hope, in a while. So here. Yes, oh. it started. Yes, so you can see how much the lashes have turned in. So we are passing some sutures to help us with the procedure of causing the outward turning so that we can see the margin. Now we are creating an incision behind the lash line, the so-called gray line. It may not be very clearly visible here because of the scarring that has taken place. But we have to make sure that we stay posterior to the line of cilia. And in these cases, we take the two ends of the incision to anterior lamina and place the graft before we place the graft. So that even if some cicatrization takes place, the cilia would not come forward. So, And we are creating a plane between the two lamina where the graft will rest. So this smoke that is created is being sucked away by the suction probe. And then, as I said, a skin muscle spindle will be removed, which will cause an outturning of the lash line, anterior lamina. Anterior lamina is now free. This is an incision at our lid crease where we will remove a spindle of skin and muscle, which will cause an outturning of the margin. And then we are taking a graft again from the lower lip. Okay. Dissecting it away. Need a thin graft. A graft in general principle is that they should be thin because... They need the blood supply from the bed. The thicker they are, the more rich vascular supply they need. So you see here, it has been post, it has been placed here. You can use a glue or you can use a sutures. Now, 80 sutures are a good material. 80 nylon is a good material for this. Here we are using 60, I think, but 80 is now a good material. But you have to make sure that you leave the ends long of the posterior ones and try, try and get them anteriorly so that there is least possibility of them causing an irritation. Now we are taking a bite, so-called quilt suture through the bed so that the graft will remain opposed to the bed. And we may not need to pass a pledget on the surface. These are quilt sutures which are taken through the bed. And now you are seeing us remove, tie the remove a spindle and do a skin muscle suturing so that margin will get further rotated away. So you can see that the rotation of cilia has taken place and the mucous membrane is now protecting and against the glow. So pre-op, you can see how the entire margin is turned in the skin, then you go here, the whatever cilia there are left will be causing irritation. Post-operatively, there is a graft in position and the cornea will heave a breath of sigh of relief. <laughs> okay. So summarizing secretracial entropion, moderate entropion, thick tarsal plate. We did a wedge resection. Most commonly used procedure is the tarsal fracture procedure. Severe entropion, mild to moderate thickening of tarsal. You'll do a tarsal fracture. Now tarsal fracture that you saw, we gave an incision only in the tarsal plate. But there are other times when you give an incision both on the skin muscle lamina and the tarsoconjunctival lamina and you can go full thickness also. And then remove a spindle of skin muscle in the anterior lamina. So this is the tarsal fracture procedure. And if tarsus is lost due to previous surgery, then marginal mucous membrane graft is a good procedure. So is uh, is it clear how secretracial entropy occurs and how we correct it? Any doubts? Sir, how can you use chondromycosal grafts for these marginal grafting procedures, sir? 
No, for the margin, we don't use chondromucosal. For the margin, we would only use a mucous membrane. The, Suppose, the, when I was talking attrition. about when I was talking about uh, the graft in the posterior lamina, then I spoke about the possible the the need for using um, graft other than yeah. mucosa alone. Because then, uh, if you use mucosa alone, it doesn't work often. So if you are using, which I've rarely used, so that is why I have skipped the video and I've skipped it in the summary. Because that was, yes. in principle, one of the methods that you put more mucus on the posterior lamina. Theoretical, more theoretical, it is hardly ever used. Okay. But if you use any graft in the posterior lamina, it should be a tarso conjunctival or a mucochondral one rather than just a mucosal one because otherwise it will contract. So this yes. is what we most often use. Okay. Any questions from the postgraduates? So shall we go on to age-related entropion or involutional entropion, our final entity? So now, now the involutional entropion, you all identify this with the hump that we have. We'll talk about this. You have lashes turning in. There are times when you correct it, it will stay corrected. But when you tell the patient to again close his eyes, you will see the lashes turn in with the spasm. So this is the involutional or age-related entropion. This hump is because of the override of preceptal orbicularis oculi over the pretarsal orbicularis oculi. And we'll see why it occurs. Also, a second sign that you often see is that when you tell the patient to look down, the normal downward excursion of the eyelid which normally occurs when you look down, the eyelid also moves down. That is reduced. And that is because of the lower lid retractors support being lost. The attachment of lower lid retractors to tarsus has been lost. And that is why you do find that when you look down, the eyelid does not move down as well. And especially in Caucasians, you can also note on the conjunctival aspect the retracted part of the lower lid retractors away from tarsus, you can sometimes observe that. And that is often used in what is called the surgery that is done from the posterior lamina in these cases, where you advance the that line or the gray line or whatever the line of retracted muscle is then advanced. That is one of the procedures that is done for involutional entropy. So now let's see why or how the mechanism, uh, the involutional entropion is occurring and how it can be corrected. Now, what are the factors that lead to the entropion occurring in the older age group? So one is, so what, what you have to consider is, uh, let's see. Can you see my hands again? Now, the distal yes. part, okay, is the uh, part of this is now the lower lid that we are talking about. Earlier, we were talking about the upper lid for secretarial entropy and mainly. But of course, those procedures hold true for upper and lower lid because now we get as much of secretarial entropy in, in the lower lid as well because of all those causes that we spoke about, Stevens-Johnson, chemical burns, OCP. So those are applicable for upper and lower lid. But now the involutional entropion is only exclusively in the lower lid. So now this part is the, and the uh, involutional entropion occurs in the lower lid and we'll see the lower lid picture later. This unfortunately is the upper lid picture, so we'll not be able to explain it. But since the, the anatomy is analogous, in the lower lid you have retractors corresponding to the um, levator aponeurosis. What is that? What is the lower lid retractor? The capsulopalpebral head of the inferior rectus, which is the lower lid retractor, which is corresponding to this. And so what happens in, in involutional entropy is we'll see it in the animation. One is that there is this absorption of fat. So there is an enophthalmos. 
So the tarsal plate, which is a really a sling like this, supported on one side by the lateral tarsal ligament, on the other side by the medial um, canthal tendon. So the tarsal plate is like this, supported on one side by the medial palpebral ligament, on the other side by the lateral uh, tarsal uh, ligament. So lateral ligament and the medial ligaments are keeping this plate supported. Now this is the lower lid and this is the part close to the lashes. So this lower part of the tarsus, this one, is kept supported, pulled by lower lid retractors. Once you find that the support of the globe is gone, this tarsal plate will move towards the globe. The lower lid retractor support is gone. So this lower border of tarsus will allow the rotation to occur like this. So let's look at this now. So you have a horizontal support of the tarsus at the two ends. You have the reduced support of the tarsal plate as a whole by reduction in the volume of the orbital fat and the lower lid retraction retractors have gone. And then the preceptal muscle starts overriding the pretarsal muscle. Let's now uh, look at the animation. That will explain it very clearly and how it is corrected then. Let's see this. Aman? Uh, yes, sir, I'm starting it. I'll stop share. We'll see it two, three times so that the mechanism is clear as to how the involutional or age-related entropion is occurring. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. And you, you see that the support of the globe, start from the beginning. I think fat absorption part has been... Okay, it will come in on its own. Okay, now let's see. So this is the surgical correction that is being shown, but we'll go through the mechanism first. So these are the lower lid retractors shown here. Your your animation will have to show it. Uh, your uh, pointer will have to show it, Aman. Okay, yes. so this is the lower lid retractors. So this is the... Let's go over this whole thing again. So now you see the globe is forwards. As the globe goes back because of absorption of fat, there is more space for tarsus to turn in. Is that clear? Fat absorbed. Now the lower lid has retractors which are holding the lower border of tarsus have become lax. So what will happen? So lower border can turn out, causing the lash to turn in. And then at the same time, you can see the, the part of uh, orbicularis which is in front of the septum override the tarsal part. So when you want to correct it, you will one have to tighten the lower lid retractors which our suture is doing now. And at the same time, you will have to take care of the horizontal laxity which we will see later. And because you have given a line of incision here between the preceptal and pretarsal part, you've created a scar line which does not allow the override to occur. So fat absorption allowing the eyelashes to turn in, the eye, the tarsus to become unstable. Then the lower lid retractor laxity allowing the lower border of tarsus to, which is no longer supported to move out so that lashes can turn in. And the override is taking place at the same time. You can see the preceptal part override the pretarsal part. So here we have given an incision in the skin muscle. We've gone to the lower lid retractors, defined them, tightened them so that the lash margin has turned out. And at the same time, a line of scar has been created which does not allow the override to occur. Is that clear to everybody? Is the principle now clear? Yes. What this does not show is the support horizontally. So you may need to tighten the lateral tarsal strip as well and in many cases and in some severe cases, the medial canthal tendon also. So the horizontal support, this is a vertical section, but you also may need to tighten it horizontally. Okay. Is the principle clear? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs>
I should say yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A teacher needs reassurance. It's yes, clear it's, <clears throat> it's clear okay, to us. You can stop sharing. Yeah, thank you. So, um, how do we diagnose age-related or involutional entropion? One is that we know that this patient is um, in the involutional ptosis age group, 60s, 70s. Then you see this hump due to overriding of the, uh, the preceptal over pretarsal part. And uh, also what I mentioned, absence of lower lid retraction in down gaze. Normally, our eyelid moves down with the movement of the eye by about 3-4 millimeter. This is absent. So you are able to diagnose. Now, what do you assess in addition? You also need to look at the laxity, amount of laxity. And you also need to assess whether it is lateral laxity or lateral and medial laxity or medial laxity alone. Most often, lateral and sometimes lateral and medial combined. So if there is laxity, then you need to take care of horizontal laxity as well. So this is what we will see in our surgical management. So as we saw in that animation, the principle of surgical correction is to restore back whatever was abnormal and correct the pathophysiology. We corrected the override, we corrected the tightening of the, corrected the loosening of the lower lid retractors, but at the same time, we also correct the horizontal laxity. So you correct the pathology. So that is why without pronounced lid laxity, Jones procedure or tightening of the lower lid retractors alone may work, may work. With severe lid laxity, you may need to combine it with lateral tarsal tightening, lateral okay. tarsal strip procedure. We'll see these two videos and that will be the last part of the talk. So this is an example of an involutional entropion. So let's look at the surgical technique now. So we've given a line of incision, as you've seen, about three millimeters below the lower lid margin. This is against surgeon's view. This is the lower lid and this is the lash line. And we are given an incision with a vertical perpendicular incision at the lateral canthus. Now we're going under the skin and orbicularis and dissecting the skin and orbicularis away. And then you see this like the, in the upper lid pre aponeurotic pad of fat, which is always not so well defined. And below that lies the lower lid retractors, which are just anterior to the conjunctiva. So these are the lower lid retractors seen here. This is the uh, uh, septum that we had opened with uh, pre, uh, pre septal fat, post septal fat. And once you have defined the lower lid retractors, now we are going to tighten them. We are picking up the lower lid retractor in this suture and then attaching it to the tarsus. Now, the first thing that we do is in the center and titrate to see how much correction has come. Whether the correction has come, whether it has become right correction or over correction, that needs to be assessed by tightening of the lower lid retractor. And thirdly, when you tie that suture, you should see that the lower lid excursion in the down gaze has come back. So you pass several such sutures and then you excise the excess skin as a triangle on the lateral side where you had given your vertical incision and then you close the skin. So that corrects the thing. I think we can play it again to explain the principles again. So this is an incision. Medial third is not given an incision because you don't want an ectropion of punctum to take place. Lateral two thirds and then a perpendicular incision here. Dissection between skin muscle and the underlying structures. Now, what is that underlying structure? When we cut the orbicularis, you will see this. So you find this fat prolapsing. So when you open the orbital septum, this fat will become visible. And just behind that, you now you notice, is the lower lid retractors. Have the structures become clear now? So these are the lower lid retractors, which you see now, which are dehist, which have separated from the tarsal border. You can see this distance between the tarsal border and the lower lid retractors. We've defined that. Now we're going to reattach this lower lid retractor to the tarsal plate. 
And that we are doing by taking a bite through the skin muscle, now through the lower lid retractor, now through the lower border of tarsus, and then tightening the suture. So first suture can be used to check titrate, that correction has been achieved, that lower lid retractor. When you hold the lower lid retractor and tell the patient to look down, you can feel a distinct tug and you can confirm that this is a lower lid retractor. And after this is done, you will notice that when the patient looks down, the lower movement of the lid has been established. Now we are cutting skin laterally, not horizontally, because that can sometimes lead to overcorrection. And now we are suturing that lateral line as well. So this has been sutured, this has been sutured, and you can notice how well the margin has rotated out. I hope the procedure of lower lid retractor tightening or Jones procedure is clear. So as you see, it, it corrects the pathophysiological factors that are involved. Surgery can be titrated exactly. It has high success rates and minimum recurrence rates. Of course, when uh, Ajit Babu, when we were there, we were using the double breasting of uh, wheelers. But yes. now that procedure is rarely used. Now that was combined with a tarsal spindle, tarsal triangle excision. With So in triangle excision, Classically, in entropian correction was with the base down. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, we did a double breasting or tightening of the muscle lamina. But that was before the this pathophysiology of lower lid retractor was understood. But now that this is understood, this is the more common procedure. Now, in cases with laxity, we'll combine it with lateral canthal tendon or medial canthal tendon tightening. We'll see more of medial canthal tending tightening when we next time discuss ectropion. So you can see that with this procedure, you are able to correct the hump, correct the interning. You are able to get a good correction. Seen in more magnification here. The lash, the lid margin is now replaced instead of an uh, interned mm -hmm. margin. So if there is a significant laxity, then you need this procedure of lateral tarsal strip or lateral tightening of the lower lid. Let's look briefly at this procedure. So this is the lateral tarsal strip procedure. We've done a lateral canthotomy, gone through the tarsus. Now we have done a lot cantholysis as well. Removed this attachment of tarsus up to the orbital margin. We have completely freed it. And then we are making this strip by cutting at the lower border of tarsus. And then we remove all the mucosa from this part, which is going to get buried. Because you don't want any mucosal epithelium to get buried and form a cyst later. So we'll just leave a bare tarsus behind here, removing all the mucosa from there. So now this is the tarsal strip formation that has taken place. And from this part, the skin and including the lashes will be removed. Now we pass a double arm suture through this tarsal plate, the strip that we had formed. Now, since we don't have a double arm suture, we've used a needle, a free needle on the other side. And then we will take a bite through the orbital margin. Now, this bite, importantly, is to come through periorbita, peri which is behind the orbital margin. So this will be above the lateral tubercle. So a little upward shift is also taking place. And this bite is going through very firm tissue of the periorbita and periosteum. So your bite starts behind the margin, but emerges in front of the lateral orbital margin, just above the lateral tubercle. So what that has done is, it has tightened the lower lid, shortened the lower lid, and now we are passing a vertical mattress suture through the gray line of the lower and the upper lid to reform the canthus. So the lateral canthus is being reformed, making sure we maintain this nice acute angulation. And then further sutures are placed in the skin to do a complete closure. So I hope the lateral tarsal strip procedure is now understood. Earlier we used to do the... Uh, Smith's modification of Kunz-Zymanowski, where we removed a full thickness triangle like this of the lid to tighten the lid. But now, since we can avoid any marginal uh, distortion by staying at the canthus, 
this procedure has become very popular. Now, you need to know another procedure, which is lateral canthopexy, which is where we avoid even the opening up of the uh, lateral canthus. We just tighten it with sutures. I'll show you that procedure when we talk about the ectropion. Now, there are cases which are not fit for surgery, where you want to do a more temporary procedure or where you want to have sutures, which are combined with other techniques alone, only for uh, older patients who cannot undergo surgery. But as a part of another su surgery, you can do an everting suture. Now, you saw inverting suture what we were doing. In inverting suture, we were... Uh, you uh, in everting suture for entropion, it will have to be closer to the fornix when, when we are on the inside and on the surface we are coming out closer to the margin as we did for secretarial entropion. In secretarial entropion, you also saw that we started from the upper part of the tarsus, which was away from the margin on the inner side and came anteriorly closer to the lash line. So the same principle is used for passing sutures alone. Now, when these everting sutures are used, they are used with a material which will cause more reaction, like something like 4-0 chromic catgut, which causes more reaction. So when you pass this suture, it will cause the margin to turn out. But you can also use horizontal sutures, which will also cause scarring and cause a little eversion. So these sutures can also be used as a supplemental procedure or as a procedure alone in some of the severer cases. Tied as three double arm sutures, which will cause an eversion of the margin. So finally, the summary, involutional entropion, without pronounced laxity, we do Jones procedure, Jones. marked lid laxity, lateral task procedure alone or with Jones procedure. So thank you. I think we've covered the principles. The purpose was only to give you the principles and a visual idea. The rest you can read up. You can understand all the other concepts. Other procedures are also there as we were talking about. Jashe Arts or uh, uh, the, uh, the Fox's procedure or Smith's modification of Kunt, Zemanowski and so on and so forth. But we'll not talk about them. And uh, we will let you understand these principles. Go over them. We will start the next class when we talk about ectropion. We'll start with a small discussion of asking of questions from the secretarial entropion and involutional entropion and then go on to the ectropion class next time. Shall I stop share? Any questions now from the postgraduates before Dr. Ajit Babu gets into asking questions? <laughs> Postgraduates have the first right to ask questions. Any questions? There? Anyone uh, is uh, ready to ask? Pallavi, Jyoti, Sonali, Shredda, Lakshmi, Shashmita. Anyone of you? They are so any, all silent. Any questions received from the audience? Usually they don't put it in the chat box. So now I think then I am answerable to Dr. Ajit Babu, Dr. Subuddhi and the team. <laughs> any questions? You did give any Buddhi. scope to ask. <laughs> no, no, no. Really wonderful. I, I hope the concepts have been clarified to some extent. The principles have become, um, and you have a visual impression of the structures of the eyelid. That was the purpose. Professor, uh, uh, one, one, one question. I yes. mean, when I was doing a PG around uh, almost how many years back? Around 25 years back, yes. Mm. 90, 90, we used to get a lot of entropian and ectropian cases. Yes. Which of late, Probably in my clinical practice, I have seen a, a reasonable decline in the cases. Even the senile ectropion, we see two less often than what we used to see around 25 years back. 
because what what uh, surgical procedures you explained like the vas dissection we used to do during our pg days also the vas dissection the jones procedure that we are exposed to during our pg days hmm. but explain- day, the incidence probably maybe i'm 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 in a capital town so i get less cases i don't know what is your experience about i'll it. explain three reasons uh, one is that uh, trachoma has gone yes. uh, vertically yes. disappeared so secretarial entropion that we had but that was the staple diet of everyone yes. uh, that, that was the only um, at the procedure that i 90% of the times i was doing my first presentation in oculoplastics that i made ever was in molana azad when i joined in the faculty was on mucous membrane grafting for secretarial entropion because that was the first series that i could get of 15 20 cases and in a delhi of thalmic society monthly meeting i presented that as my first oculoplastic presentation ever in something like 86 1985 or 86 so because that was the only case that we used to get in very large numbers so that is one number two is age related changes are less severe in indians we are privileged to have pigmentation which protects us from all the senile changes it's much more common in caucasians uh, they get so much more age related changes skin changes entropion ectropion we only get nice bags <laughs> but they they get a lot more of entropion uh, age related ectropion that is another reason and number 3 is that earlier there were hardly any oculoplastic surgeons now uh, each metropolitan city has 20 uh, oculoplastic surgeons so they, they go to them <laughs> and uh, that is why they don't uh, they are not many floating around so not visible to general practice <laughs> so these are the three reasons i can understand So any other questions, Doctor Ajit, Doctor Subuddhi? Chandra Dr. Madam, you are silent. Chandra Madam, silent. Today's panelist. <laughs> I <I'm> just <laughs> missed my right. The uh, uh, pearls of wisdom from so. uh, the panelists, their experience of managing. So, what is the procedure uh, you use, Doctor uh, Chandana, for uh, involutional entropion most often? Uh, I use that. Uh, Jones procedure yeah. that is that for involution entropy on and uh, another one or two thing I just want to share that if the patient is not ready for surgery because of the uh, constitution issue means the patient is not well for the time being uh, we can give the, the patient themselves also they use the transparent leuco for the time being. just if when you are preparing for surgery they are used to use that transparent and pull the eye if you cannot um, identify that the patient is suffering from entropion that also uh, i have come across yeah that is one and in this case it's where the patient is not uh, fit for surgery uh, you can always do that uh, quicker suture uh, without any uh, surgery just put three sutures and the, at least for 2 3 years if the patient uh, will remain okay that yeah. is all and uh, what i feel why the number of cases uh, has decreased because this entropion and ectropion these uh, cases are not only done by the plastic surgeon they are many many of the comprehensive ophthalmologists they are doing it quite efficiently and nicely so that is another reason and uh, what i will uh, say that uh, one thing uh, everyone should understand what is dystrichiasis and not dystrichiasis or entropion but that is very important in case of dystrichiasis the except oculoplasty surgeon the other should not interfere that should be done always by the oculoplastic surgeon that is thank a must you. thank you for supporting us <laughs> <laughs> yes and another thing is that this surgery for dystrichiasis is uh, not very much means effective or the prognosis is not good 
Many of these patients, I, I have seen at least three cases where no surgery has been done till the patient is at least 20 to 21 year of age and the cornea both eye has already gone opacified. So those things, the ophthalmology should pick up at the early stage and send the patient to oculoplasty surgeon to take over. That is important. And uh, Dr. Uh, Grover, Oh, I just want to ask you one thing. This bleeding during this the procedure, like the upper uh, tarsal tarsal rejection, that uh, how do you control them? Means that is very uh, because if you use much of the uh, this uh, radio frequency and electrocautery, uh, more and more scarring occurs. So I think I have almost reduced my bipolar use to negligible by using um, all those who are fit, one in 80,000 adrenaline. So if you use, if you are I'm able sure. to use uh, xylocaine with one in 80,000 adrenaline, it comes for dental use or you can make it yourself. So if you inject that okay. for 5-10 minutes, then you get virtually a bloodless surgery. Sometimes we also mix a little bit of okay. decadron into that, uh, one ml of decadron also into the um, inje injection with a little high laser as well. And this mixture works very well for hemostasis. So that has been oh, the by you virtually see no bleed and virtually no use of bipolars in these cases. Another option you, to have in, in involutional you, or case related is to use a little Botox at the margin where there is a uh, override. If you use that, if you give two, three injections of uh, 2.5 units in, and three medially, laterally, or uh, is somebody who's not willing for surgery. And if you give a little Botox, 2.5 units at three different points in the lower lid, you can get a good uh, relief for about three months. Another thing one should be careful while doing the lateral tarsal stream so that the puncta should not be... Uh, displaced too much. That should also be taken care of. So, which means that if there is a medial canthal tendon laxity and your mm -hmm. LTS is causing a displacement, then you must at the same time do um, MCT tightening tight to retain yes. the system in the right position. Dr. Yes, Omega, your, your, uh, yes, sir. Or your observations about your experience. Sir, I also usually do Jones procedure. And usually, Jones procedure has to be accompanied with lateral tarsal strip. Otherwise, there may be chances of overcorrection. Yeah. And the proper suture uh, material is uh, important for while during lateral tarsal strip because the periosteal bite becomes difficult if we will not use proper suture material and proper needle. Usually, 4-0 vehicle works good for lateral tarsal strip. With proline suture, the patient usually complains of foreign body senses and irritation in the lateral canthal area. And 60 of hyacryl doesn't stand, doesn't support that much. So 40 of hyacryl is a good suture of choice while doing lateral tarsal strips. I agree. 40 of hyacryl is a very good material for that purpose. Mm -hmm. so, but it is important to position that suture very well. That, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, not only should it be causing tightening, it should be attaching it to the lateral orbital rim slightly above the normal position yes. of the lateral canthal tendon. So that is important. And and you um, start the bite behind the orbital margin and come out in front of the margin. And you must feel that very thick bite through the periosteum and the very good hold that it gives you. Only then will the tightening be effective. So that's a very important tip that you have given that lateral suture is vital in lateral tarsal strip procedure. And then remaking the canthus well so that you retain the angulation, retain the attachment of the lateral canthus to the lateral rim. Those are important points in lateral tarsal strip procedure. And also, sir, in patients having negative vector, like the myopic people, when the malar prominence is less than the globe prominence, in those cases, tightening should be done meticulously. Otherwise, it will lead to more amount of uh, uh, retraction 
lead traction, low lead traction. Over tightening should be avoided in myopic patients. Yes. So also you stressed very well that if there is an element of laxity and you have not taken care of it, you have just done the lower lid retractors, it will tend to cause um, overcorrection. Out, outward uh, laxity causing outward turning. Yes. yes so that laxity should always be corrected whenever present. Otherwise, How do we assess the degree of uh, laxity, lower lid laxity? So one of the procedures is to hold, uh, say, let's say, uh, four millimeters inner to the lateral canthus with the uh, tooth forceps after anesthesia and, and stretch it outwards and see whether it causes adequate tightening. Otherwise, you may need 6 millimeter, 8 millimeter. But you also do what is called the laxity, uh, the uh, the pinch test. So yeah. how pinch. much it pinches, um, if it is more than 6 millimeter is considered as very significant yeah. laxity, and then you must correct it. Similarly, the release, the relaxation test after you... Uh, Snap that test. Yeah, snap back, how well it is snapping back. So if the snap back is very slow, then again, you know that there is a lid laxity. So after you pull and released, if it goes back very slowly, you know that there is a laxity. So you must take care of that amount of laxity. Yes. Assessment yes. of how much you have to tighten, you can do very well yes. under the, after the block with the holding with the forceps and tightening it to see how much tightening would be the right tightening. Okay, I think uh, now it's the time for Dr. Patnaik to give his comments. Savitrati. Savitrati Patnaik. Uh, nothing much to say. I felt like a classroom teaching, just like. Uh, <laughs> yes, happened. that's true. Yeah. I mean, me too. I was just listening and learning. Uh, excellent. Okay. Piece of teaching by Dr. Grover. We are obliged to you for your yes. this excellent uh, teaching on and we will be interested to listen to your, your talk on uh, ectropion also in the next class. Thank you. 27th of February. Yes. 27th of February. It's already been fixed. So there was one comment on the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Sharmishta. His, uh, Thank you very much, sir, for sparing. Sir, your, uh, I your just want to say one sentence, sir. Yeah, it was more. Uh, I it was more like a student. Uh, I was sitting, sir. I my take home message is. I was just typing that my take home message is uh, lesser use of the entropian clamp, uh, which I was very fond of. Now we can do more uh, from end to end uh, with the hemostatic uh, procedure, which you said, sir. One is to eighty thousand. It didn't one Yes, sir. With the I have written. <laughs> <laughs> with dexamethasone and hyaluronic. I noted down all the notes. <laughs> <laughs> you start with the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I have. I always keep a notes. <laughs> so I'm Mr. Rahul, Rahul. Rahul. I'm accountable for what I said. Yes, yes. It will be video? verified later. <laughs> Rahul, do you have a video to play? Is Rahul there? <laughs> Rahul is there. He's there, but he's uh, not here. Have we recorded today's... Um, yeah, yeah, it has yeah. been recorded, sir. It will be put up on the website also and also on the YouTube. YouTube. Yes. Yeah. So we can give it to our postgraduates who have not been yeah, able yeah. to. So that, yes. Yes, sir. Thank so you, once sir. again, thank you, everybody. And thanks, Dr. Thank you, sir. It's a really wonderful class today. And uh, it's really one of the thing, best thing. And thanks to Omega, uh, thank Dr. Sarmishta, Dr. Chandana, Madam. Thank you all for joining this today's program. Thank you. you. Good night. Thank, thank you all. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Next to RTS will be on 27th. Yes, the same is. speaker, Dr. Yes. Grover, <laughs> his master <laughs> voice. Only <laughs> ENT <laughs> says the easy thing, Dr. Beer. Yes, <laughs> fine. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, it's really good.
राहुल है पता नहीं क्यों वो बात 